There are 13 major metabolic pathways that you need to know for the MCAT. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to teach you every single one of them, which means at the end of this video, this cell will look like this, and you'll actually understand it. So let's get started. This is a eukaryotic cell. For this video, we're going to focus on eukaryotic metabolism, as that is what's most likely to be tested on the MCAT. We're going to identify where each pathway occurs in this cell and in the body, what each pathway needs as precursors, and what are they going to produce as products. Then we'll briefly talk about why and when we use each pathway. We're going to start with our first of 13 pathways, glycolysis. We're going to zoom in on this picture of our cell and go right up into the cytoplasm because that's where glycolysis takes place. Now I'm going to use green for all of our pathways just to keep us organized. So right up in the upper left corner is where we're going to write glycolysis. So glycolysis, glycolysis, lysis meaning breaking, glyco sugars, glucose. So what we're doing is we're breaking up glucose for fuel. So in order to do that, our precursor, of course, we need is glucose. This is carbohydrate metabolism. So we need glucose. We're also going to need some NAD plus because we're going to reduce that to NADH in glycolysis. We also need some energy to get us started here. So we're going to use two ATP early on in the glycolytic steps. I'm going to draw that with little energy around it since ATP is our energy source of our cell. So we've got glucose, NAD+, and 2-ATP coming into glycolysis, and then what we're going to produce is pyruvate as our major product, and we have two pyruvate for every one glucose. We're also going to produce NADH, and we're going to produce four ATP. Now, that means net is two ATP, right? Because we used up two and we produced four. So two net ATP, they love testing that on the MCAT. All right, so we've got our pyruvate and where pyruvate goes next depends on both our energy levels in our cell and our oxygen levels. So let's say we have high oxygen levels and low energy levels. We need energy, we have high oxygen, but we have low ATP. What we're going to do next is a pathway called the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex or reaction, PDH. Now PDH is going to produce acetyl-CoA from our pyruvate. And acetyl-CoA is our big uh, molecule that's involved in our mitochondria, so I'm going to put it right in the center here. So we've got acetyl-CoA. Pyruvate dehydrogenase also produces one molecule of NADH and one molecule of CO2. So we'll put that in, but our big one that we care about is acetyl-CoA because that's what's going to move on to our next pathway. So our next pathway is the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, and it's also in the mitochondria. So our citric acid cycle is a cycle, so I draw it kind of with arrows instead of a box, right? So it's going to be a cycle that starts with acetyl-CoA and it produces NADH, so it produces NADH. It also produces FADH2, which is another electron carrier, and CO2. But it's a cycle so it loops right back around to acetyl-CoA. So acetyl-CoA here is our precursor for the citric acid cycle right, as it goes in, and we also need NAD plus and FAD plus. All right, so that's going to be our non-hydrogenated electron carriers, and then we add our electrons to them, and they become FADH2 and NADH. Before we get to the electron transport chain, please subscribe to this channel for more videos that help you learn MCAT content test taking strategies and mental fitness so that you can perform your best on test day. All right, so once we've gone through the citric acid cycle, our electron carriers actually go into our electron transport chain. Our electron transport chain is embedded into the inner membrane of the mitochondria, so I always draw it kind of right below the citric acid cycle on the membrane. The other interesting thing about the electron transport chain, and we're going to get to this when we talk about memorizing intermediates, is complex 2 of the electron transport chain is the same enzyme as succinate dehydrogenase 
in the citric acid cycle. So they literally overlap, they have an enzyme in common, and that enzyme takes FAD and turns it into FADH2, and then back to FAD, and back to FADH2. So FADH2 doesn't have to travel far to drop off its electrons, it stays in the same enzyme complex. All right, so electron transport chain, citric acid cycle connected, and what comes into the electron transport chain, our NADH. And what's produced by our electron transport chain, I'm gonna go ahead and draw it on the outside of the mitochondria, but I want you to know that it's on the inside, is we produce water and we produce ATP. ATP, so coming into the electron transport chain is also oxygen. And this is why I said back up here, we needed oxygen. So here's the rule. If we're going to be using the mitochondria for energy production to produce ATP, we got to go through the electron transport chain. In order to go through the electron transport chain, it needs oxygen. So we have to have oxygen in our cells, in our bodies, in order for the mitochondria to do its job. So if we want the mitochondria to produce energy, we've got to have oxygen. All right, zooming back out for just a second, we can see that we have what is known as aerobic respiration. So the process of glycolysis through the PDH, through the citric acid cycle, and through the electron transport chain to produce ATP from glucose is what's commonly known as aerobic respiration. The aerobic part comes into play when we hit the mitochondria. But what if we didn't have oxygen? So what would happen to our processes if we still needed energy, but we didn't have oxygen? Well, let me show you. We're gonna zoom back into our glycolytic pathway down to pyruvate, because you'll notice here we didn't need oxygen for this part. And if we have low oxygen and we still have low ATP, we need energy, what we essentially wanna do is keep running glycolysis, right? Because glycolysis is still producing ATP, so we can still get some fuel through our cells via glycolysis. In order to do that though, we not only need a steady supply of glucose, we need a steady supply of NAD+, and that's a limited resource in our cells. So we need a way to turn our NADH back into NAD+, and the way we do that is by converting pyruvate to lactic acid. And the enzyme slash pathway that does that is lactate dehydrogenase, much like pyruvate dehydrogenase. All right, so that lactate dehydrogenase is going to take our pyruvate and turn it into lactate. And remember here, our lactate is not our goal. All right, we're not trying to produce more lactate. That's not doing anything for our cells. Our real goal is the other product, which is NAD+. All right, so we take that NAD+, and now that NAD+, can help regenerate the beginning, the precursors for glycolysis and allow us to continue doing glycolysis to make energy. Lactate is not great for our bodies, doesn't feel good, that's why we get that lactic acid buildup in our muscles when we're doing anaerobic work, because we're doing lots and lots of glycolysis and producing lactate as a byproduct. All right, now, what if we need more glucose? So we, you know, we've been doing glycolysis, we've been doing all these things, but actually our energy levels are good, we have high ATP, we're feeling pretty solid, but we don't have enough glucose. Then what we can do is we can go through gluconeogenesis. So I'm gonna draw it from pyruvate here. Just so you know, we usually have to go all the way back from the citric acid cycle and turn our oxaloacetate from our citric acid cycle back to pyruvate and then enter glycolysis. But for all intents and purposes, pyruvate is our precursor, all right? So this is gluconeogenesis. I'm gonna just write it as GNG. All right, but gluconeogenesis, genesis creation, neo new, glucose, glucose. So we're producing new glucose here. So we're gonna take our pyruvate and we're basically just gonna go back the other way, uh, do reverse glycolysis with three different steps and we're gonna produce some glucose. And our glucose will be produced by these cells. Now this glucose can go and be a precursor again for glycolysis, but if we have high energy and we have high glucose levels, we have plenty of glucose to go around, we may just wanna store that glucose for later. And the pathway that allows us to store glucose is known as glycogenesis. Genesis meaning creation, glyco, glycogen. So glycogen 
is our storage form of glucose. It's just a polysaccharide of lots of glucose monomers. So glycogen, storage form. And whenever we're ready, we just store it. And whenever we need glucose, whenever we have low glucose levels, we'll go ahead and break that glycogen down through a pathway called glycogenolysis. Lysis meaning breaking, right? So glycogen, Olysis, we're breaking glycogen down. Glycogenesis, we are forming glycogen. And so that glycogenolysis just breaks down glycogen back to glucose for use in glycolysis in the cells. An important thing to know here, this whole system, gluconeogenesis, glycogenesis, and glycogenolysis, this all happens in liver cells specifically. So this is specific to liver cells, and then liver cells can then go release that glucose to be sent out to other parts of the cell. But glycogen storage happens in the liver, and gluconeogenesis, formation of new glucose, also happens in liver cells. So this is not just all cells, this is specific to the liver. All right, so that was all of carbohydrate metabolism. We now have everything that can happen with carbohydrates in terms of metabolic processes in our cell. Before we move on to lipid metabolism, I do wanna mention one lower yield pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway. This pathway branches off of glycolysis, pentose phosphate pathway, and this pathway is used when we have plenty of energy to go around, so we have high ATP levels, and instead what we need is nucleotides and NADPH. So our products here from the pentose phosphate pathway are nucleotides, like new DNA molecules, right, nucleotides, and NADPH, which we're going to see in a moment. So I just wanted to mention the pentose phosphate pathway produces NADPH. So NAD plus comes in, NADP plus, and Pre, uh, intermediates from glycolysis. There's several points at which it can enter the pentose phosphate pathway via the glycolytic intermediates, but our product here is nucleotides or NADPH. So that is just a low yield but important pathway when we're talking about lipid metabolism, which we're going to hit shortly. All right, let's say we don't have enough glucose and we need to break down fats for our energy. So we're going to start with fatty acids. Fatty acids are going to be our precursors here. And again, we need to have oxygen because the process of breaking down fatty acids actually happens partially in and partially outside of the mitochondria. And that process, that pathway, is called beta oxidation. Beta oxidation. We're going to kind of draw it into the mitochondria. All right, so fatty acids come in and acetyl-CoA is produced and then from there that acetyl-CoA goes right into the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain as long as there's oxygen so that we can produce ATP. So we need to have oxygen here for beta oxidation. And this will happen when we need energy, low ATP, and we also do not have glucose, low glucose right? Because we're going to be using fatty acids instead. All right, let's say we have plenty of energy to go around. We actually want to store some fats. We've got plenty of sugar, plenty of energy. We don't need that acetyl-CoA to come from fats anymore, so we're going to go ahead and store it. And we're going to store it through a pathway called fatty acid synthesis. I'm going to write it as FAS here. All right, now this happens out in the cytosol. The issue is our acetyl-CoA is in our mitochondria. So the first thing that needs to happen here is we need to shuttle it out. And we do that via what's known as a citrate sh shuttle. So we turn our acetyl-CoA into citrate. And there's this couple steps here that we're not gonna get into in this video, but it's gonna shuttle itself out of the mitochondria and then be our precursor for fatty acid synthesis. Fatty acid synthesis is of course going to produce our fatty acids. So boom, fatty acids becomes our product. And from there, we can go even further and build what's known as triglycerides, which is our final storage form of fats, triglycerides, tags. 
all right? So that is, it's a relatively simple process, but there's one key piece here. In addition to the citrate coming into the fatty acid synthesis, we also need NADPH. NADPH in order for fatty acid synthesis to happen. It's a series of reduction reactions and we need an electron carrier. So what's really cool is where this NADPH comes from is our pentose phosphate pathway. So both the pentose phosphate pathway and the fatty acid synthesis pathway will happen when we have plenty of energy, all right? Our energy is fine, we have no energy need, and in fact, we're in storage mode. So that NADPH will help for fatty acid synthesis. In terms of where in the body this happens, fatty acid synthesis is again happening mostly in liver cells. So when in doubt, if there is a specific cell in which metabolism is happening, it's probably the liver or muscle cells. All right, we have one more type of metabolism to go and it's very low yield on the MCAT, so I just wanna mention where it is and how it happens, and that is our protein metabolism. So for protein metabolism, we have just two pathways to think about, ketogenesis, again, genesis forming ketone bodies. So ketogenesis, again, happens with the mitochondria kind of in and out, so we're gonna draw it this way, ketogenesis, genesis, and it's happening by pulling acetyl-CoA and intermediates from the citric acid cycle and forming what are known as ketone bodies. All right, ketone bodies can be used as a source of energy for the brain if our sugar levels are really low. So our brain can only use carbohydrates as a source of energy. If our carb sources are really low, like we, we haven't eaten any sugar in a while, what we'll do instead is we'll produce ketone bodies and then bring those ketone bodies to the brain for energy so that they can use ketone bodies instead of using glucose because we don't have any glucose. Uh, again, the brain cannot use fat for energy. Now, if we don't need those ketone bodies, we can go ahead and do ketolysis, right? Same kind of deal uh, that we've seen in our glycogen formation and breakdown. So ketolysis, again, I'm gonna kind of draw it in and out of our mitochondria because it's there, it's getting a little messy, but that's okay. And then that's going to eventually form our citric acid cycle intermediates again, like alpha ketoglutarate. All right, so going out ketone bodies and then coming back in through ketolysis, our final pathway to produce our citric acid cycle intermediates and again, be used for fuel. That's what's happening in the brain. The brain is doing ketolysis to break down those ketone bodies for fuel. All right, we did it. Here is all 13 metabolic pathways on one page for you to review and go through the precursors and the products. So just to review, we went through the following metabolic reactions in this video. Glycolysis pyruvate dehydrogenase complex reaction, the citric acid or Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain, lactic acid fermentation, gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, glycogenolysis, yep, saying that nice and slow, the pentose phosphate pathway, beta oxidation, fatty acid synthesis, ketogenesis, and ketolysis. You now know when and where these reactions happen and what their precursors and products are. Next up, you'll wanna learn how they're turned on and off. We talked briefly about this, but I want you to step it up by learning the hormonal and homeostatic regulations for each of these metabolic processes in our bodies. Then finally, before test day, maybe a couple weeks before, memorize those key intermediates and enzymes for each of the pathways we talked about today. Then you're all set to master metabolism on the MCAT. One more thing, if you're watching this video but have not yet taken a practice exam, you need to take one. It will help you figure out your strengths and your weaknesses and make an effective, efficient study plan. I promise you it's worth the time to do it. So there's a link in the description below for a free course that I have that will teach you how to take a practice exam, how to review it effectively, and how to use that info to make your study plan. Go ahead and check it out. And as always, happy studying.